I, I think that we're going to start off by recognizing in a positive way. Some people are going to be like, well, that's not nice. We all have something. We all have something. Um, whether it's as obvious as a wheelchair um, or, or, or not, you don't know Most what people yeah, are dealing with something. Yeah. Even a bad day. That is something, That is right? something. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I think that just by starting off by saying that, I hope it helps some people kind of realize that since we all have something, it, it, it doesn't hurt and you don't have to feel bad or ashamed or embarrassed when, when you recognize, I need to even in the playing field. And, and I need to say, you know what, can you help me do this? Which is the hardest lesson I'm still trying to learn in life. Can you help me with this? Um, so that it doesn't, it doesn't stop you from the role that you're already on in, in, in a given activity. And, and I've, I've seen that and I'm sure, you know, you guys have seen this in similar arenas, um, but, but applying for academic programs, applying for jobs, it's really scary to make the decision to say, okay, so I'm awesome in these, you know, 10 different ways. However, not even however, and I, I need some help in these areas. And, and I'd love to sit down with the head of the school or, or the employer and talk about how to accommodate these so that I can show my worth and I can contribute to whatever organization it is, right? And, and so that, that's really hard. Um, it's easier said than done. So, so I, I was hoping that if you guys felt comfortable, we can talk about ways that we might, we, we might need help in life that may not be so obvious. So I suffer from depression, anxiety, and I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, which is not fun. So, so that, that rears its ugly head every once in a while, whether I'm expecting it or not. You know, it, the triggers were much more pronounced at the beginning and, and the simplest of tasks would get my heart pumping. And, 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 you know, sometimes there's nightmares. And, and so I'm not ashamed to say that over the course, since I was 10 years old, I've been on medication, I've sought out um, psychological help, and, and I've really started promoting self-care. Um, yeah. so, so like those three things have, have done wonders for me. And for those of you who don't know what self-care is, it's recognizing that you need your me time. There, you, you deserve, you know, doing an activity that you love. You deserve to binge watch Fuller House is on, and I watched it just because I grew up, so it was more of a loyalty thing. You, you binge. You, 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 you do what makes you, you feel yourself, good. You allow yourself to take the time. And not feel guilty about it, because it bolsters not only, it, it bolsters your spirit, it bolsters your mind, and then that does wonders for your body. It's, it's this whole connection. So I think uh, mental health isn't given nearly enough credit, and but I'm I'm seeing a positive turn, which mm -hmm. I'm really liking. Um, like you said, it's self care. When you have when you have a physical problem, your instinct is go to the doctor and, and get advice on how to how to correct the street or not correct, but you know deal with it, all those sorts of things. But when somebody's feeling depressed or sad or anxious, um, the unfortunate stigma is to not talk about it, to pretend like it doesn't exist, pretend like it doesn't happen, instead of going to a doctor and discussing yeah. it and getting tools to improve your situation and change things. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge advocate of that as well. I know prior to my injury, I was like anti, antidepressants. <laughs> anti, <laughs> antidepressants. I, I, didn't, I, thought, I thought they were, I thought it was ridiculous. It's more medication for the body. It's, it's mm -hmm. just, it's like, why would you do that? It's, um, and then I was basically forced to go on them because after my spinal cord injury I was not handling things very well and um, I learned that it was actually just a really helpful tool to get me to a place where I'm functional happy feeling good like I don't I actually I now feel zero guilt zero anything I'm like yeah whatever it helps me <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing and smiling good you know <laughs> and uh, and um, an analogy I, I used to use is it always it kind of feels like um, you're trying to go home and you're like laden down with, with bags and stuff and you're just like, I can't carry this all and you're just freaking out and it's raining and blah, blah, blah. And then you're, a friend comes along. This friend is called antidepressant. <laughs> Let me take some of those bags for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then you go for a walk and then 
you know, it, it just it makes it easier. Yeah. And then if you feel like getting off of it, then you're like, okay, I'm feeling a little bit stronger, I'm feeling a little better, you can give me some of those bags back. Mm -hmm. Until perhaps you're feeling strong enough that you're carrying all of them on your own, or maybe you still need to, to keep it, you know, you, you're not strong enough you need to, to carry all the bags all the time. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's good to ask for help. Yeah! I'm so hard to do that. That is, again, yeah, I'm the same, especially as an acquired injury. Yeah. I find it, I, I still struggle. It's, it's uh, seven years, seven and a half years post injury, and I still struggle. Yeah. It was only like in the last six months that I finally went, okay, I can't walk long distances. I need an assistive device. Yeah. Just ask for it, Christina. Yeah. Stop killing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I think it comes down to uh, dealing with the root cause of an issue as opposed to band-aid solutions. Mm -hmm. I saw a story recently through social media about how um, you know people are kind of having backlashes because they're creating suicide prevention bridge, uh, offenses on bridges, but that's not where the money needs to be going, mm -hmm. creating fences on bridges. Mm -hmm. It needs to be going on actually providing support to those individuals who are feeling right. suicidal, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and that's just a specific example about mental health. So that is where self-advocation really comes into play mm -hmm. because if individuals who are on the outside looking in, maybe they don't deal with depression mm -hmm. and they're thinking that's the solution, create a bridge so they don't jump or create a fence so they don't jump off of a bridge. Well, there's other ways to commit suicide first of all, yeah. but secondly, that doesn't solve the yeah. issue yeah. and that doesn't deal right with the root cause. I mean, I would, I'm going to be completely honest with everybody. Uh, you know, I speak, uh, you know, and do motivational things. However, I have shitty days too. Right. Uh, and you know, I'm pretty sure you're posting this on the, on the web, so it doesn't really matter if I swear. No, uh, no, no, no. I want this to be like yeah, really no. just authentic. It, and that, that is authentic, you know? So not every day is going to be perfect for myself. You know, uh, personally, I, I'm not taking any forms of meds myself. However, it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about introspection and self-reflection. And so in those moments where, you know, times are a little bit tougher or I'm not feeling the greatest, you, you take a step back and, you know, maybe apply some of my own strategies for others on myself mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I move <laughs> forward. But it's also about the people who you have around you. That support network in itself is like a drug, yeah. you know, because to know that my wife is so supportive, the, the friends that I have in my life are so mm -hmm. supportive, to me, that makes the biggest difference in the world. Of course, mm -hmm. that doesn't solve everything, mm -hmm. but it's a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, you know, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. What about yourself? I mean, like, uh, you know, with you and, and working as a, a paramedic, I'm sure that you've seen some traumatic situations, um, and you've seen some situations where people are dealing with some hard times. Yeah. Uh, what would you say to this? I you want to go out. Yeah. <laughs> Feel good interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's challenging, definitely. It doesn't really matter, as you notice, it doesn't really matter what your current state physiologically or, or mentally is. Everyone is going to have some kind of difficulty, yeah. depending on the time of day, depending on their family background, depending on a, a, what, a moment you know, of, of anger during you know, in drive here. Hormones, <laughs> traffic, <laughs> traffic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, working working in the ambulance service uh, does have its uh, you know benefits, but there is a lot of stress involved, a lot of uh, or what we call um, operational. Well, sorry, that's the, mili the military calls it operational stress injury, mm -hmm. PTSD or depression, anxiety, and yeah, it's you know even now we're trying to figure out ways to address and solve these issues, you know. On the surface, but also at the root problem, yeah. doing them hand in hand, yeah. and it's it's challenging. And <clears throat> uh, we've all mentioned self care, and that I believe self advocacy, like you said, is key. Um, and but it's key, but we have to address, you know, family support, uh, institutional support, and uh, mm -hmm. this just brings up some uh, framework that I have learned in school. It's uh, Bronf and Brenner's uh, social ecological framework. It's just a human framework for development, mm -hmm. and you've seen it in all one form or another. It's just about you know, the first circle is the individual, the second circle, the family, the peers, the third circle will be government policies, and, mm -hmm. and f the fourth and larger circle will be uh, the culture of the society. Mm -hmm. And all these things mm -hmm. interconnect together. So yeah. self-advocacy, yes. Family support, yes. Institutionalization, how is the society um, helping you uh, with regards to your needs? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, since we have some people here working using wheelchairs, I was in Mexico a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and the wheelchair map, on the sidewalk, it was literally a 45 degree incline. 
Ooh. Like how? That's not. That's unfathomable in a wheelchair. <laughs> that was yeah. my old driveway. Even walking up on my two feet, I actually felt felt some ankle pain going up that ramp. And it's just what does the society do to help people with certain conditions? And you know, it's all it's all big into play. I mean, it's it's interesting because an example like that is about positive intention. Right, they're mm-hmm. intending to create, yeah. uh, not create a barrier. Yeah. However, they are still creating more of a barrier because if anybody, if, if you don't know, if you're going to attempt to wheel up a 45 degree angle yeah. ramp, if you uh, any at any point shift your weight backwards and you don't have anti tippers on a wheelchair, for example, you're going to flip backwards. Down. So that's going to be worse for you in the long run. Where the actual standard slope is actually eight percent. So 45 between 45 and eight is a pretty big difference. Yeah. 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 And actually speaking, you know, from a practitioner point of view, I don't know if you you find this. Um, so let's say somebody is dealing with mental health issues. It, it, it's, it's going to vary, obviously, from practitioner to practitioner and what works for the patient um, or the person you're dealing with. I don't like to use the word patient very much unless, you know, I'm a patient person, which I'm not. So I don't even <laughs> like to do it in that perspective either. Um, so some people... You know, it's a choice that you have to make. So practitioners, you might have somebody who's right in front of you who you're helping, who's crying, and you feel it too. Like you, mm. you're, you're, and and so you have to make that decision in that moment. Oh no, I I don't have the right to cry right now or or show emotion because I don't want the person who's struggling right now to think, oh god, now they're crying. Mm. I actually have to shift my focus and you know, comfort them and say, oh, no, 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 it, it, it's fine. And, or, or sometimes the person who's struggling is like, oh, they understand. Like, yeah. they see that this isn't nothing. And, and, and so it can go, you know, one of two ways. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's really interesting. And if you've had a breakdown or two or, you know, to the extent that you're like, oh, I know that it really helps when the person is like, okay, let's, let, let's, look at the steps or I just need to vent. And so sometimes I do have a lot of friends who are in the social work field now and I will call one of them and I will literally start off the conversation if I'm struggling saying, okay, I just need to vent. I don't need you to come up with a solution. I need to vent or I need you to be a social worker right now. Mm. Or I just need you to be my best friend who knows me and needs to help me through this. So, so, you know, the more you struggle, you also learn how to, what works for you. So hopefully you're able to say next time to whoever's helping you, you know what, just so you know from the get-go, it really helps when you do this. Or if you just, you know, let me vent or, you know, and even as a practitioner learning to say, you know, I I, I could do what I normally do and what feels right for me, but what, what do you need right now? Do you need to vent or, and having that communication going, not pretending that you know everything, yeah. and really screwing them up. <laughs> yeah. Because you're you're you have that ego or or you're trying to be that pillar of strength for them. It, it's it's I always have so there's much no right answer. <laughs> people who are able to say, I don't know, let me find out. Yeah. <laughs> so much respect. I don't need my anyone, anyone to to act like they know because they're supposed to be the authority on right, the matter. Right, right, yeah. right. It it actually really frustrates me, um, because it, it comes across even worse when you're trying to fake it. Mm-hmm. Yes. I have, I have some friends in uh, medical school and nursing school who tell me when they're doing uh, when they're doing the rotations in the hospitals and clinics. Hospitals and clinics. Um, when my friends have questions about a certain physiological pro- physiological process or uh, something scientific related, they ask their superior, and the superior says, uh, "You don't need to know this. Well, you, that's." You don't need to know this. It's not necessary for you to know. And most of the time, that's they probably say that because they may not know the answer themselves, and they yeah. just don't want to admit. They don't want to admit that they don't know. They yeah. don't want to step down from their high horse, so to speak, and it's frustrating. It's really frustrating because you can tell. Yeah. And I had like every experience I've ever had when somebody actually just says, "Look, I don't know, but I'll find out for you," has been a positive one for me. My dad, he's a teacher as well, and he's not in the healthcare field, but he said that he gets great reviews on his um, his teacher evaluations mm-hmm. because that is one thing that he, he does commonly is mm-hmm. just go, "Look, I don't know, but I'll find out for you next class." And and the students are just like, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being bullshitted with right now. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I want to say that I think we are getting better with I being, so too. you know, 
honest with ourselves as yeah. well as with our clients, patients, whoever. And yeah. um, I feel like we're better at not jumping to conclusions, not making assumptions and yeah. whatnot. Well, I think it's, it's yeah. I think it's also part to do with what would you call the MCAT? I actually don't know what that is. The the uh, What's the acronym for it's again? Med so medical College Admissions Test. There you go. The medical okay. schools in North America. Okay, yeah, yeah. so how the, it's changing. The, yeah. the requirements of a person are changing. I think that we are in a, in a shift because the doctors used to be. They needed to be the authority. That was what was expected mm -hmm. of them, but now we're totally shifting, and mm -hmm. I personally love it mm -hmm. because now we're getting more honesty. We're getting more human interaction yeah. because the doctors never were gods or the be all end all they just acted like it <laughs> well they had to you know yeah. to to just calm everybody else down but it did i think you know turning to a slippery slope where where you're like oh i i i'll i'll, I'll you know it's fine you don't need to know that or mm -hmm. and 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 it's just kind of like especially when a doctor says that to you it's just like um, I'm pretty sure that I need to know because it's going to impact me and you're going to get to go home after this. Yeah, <laughs> it's not collaborative and it needs yeah. to be. You, you say a lot that you're, you know, it's just where they self-advocate. Like you have to know your yeah. own body and your own needs. Yeah. As much as the doctor knows, as much as the therapist knows, you're at some point are living this and getting yeah. to know yourself. So, for example, I'll actually, and I don't recommend doing this, you can <laughs> talk to your doctor, but personally, I feel comfortable changing some of my medications slightly and I don't feel the need to go to the doctor every time. And I get frustrated when the doctor freaks out at me because I'm like, but come on. Like, look, yeah. I know my body. I know what I need. Yeah. And I don't need your, your lip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I've, I, I've been taking care of myself. Yeah. I'm, and, um. I mean, you got to be stay responsible, and I don't. I really don't advocate anyone doing that. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that you got to know your own body, yeah. and you got to be able to communicate that with your with your with your doctor, even if they're kind of wanting to argue with yeah. you a little bit. Yeah. You know, stand up for what you know is good in your body. Yeah. I can't tell you the number of times I had to have discussions with nurses and doctors while I was in the hospital, yeah. and sort of say, No, I don't want this. I don't need this. Yeah. Stop trying to give it to me. Yeah. And I didn't need it, mm -hmm. and so. It's really important to stand up. Don't just let them bully you over. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, listen to their advice. They've, they've had training. They know. <laughs> but don't let them bully you over either. Don't let, I think. Yeah, I think it gets to the point where what, what I think is really just important to remember is that the nurse is really important on your team. The doctor is really important on the team. The social worker is really important on the team. But you know what? Nobody knows you like you know you. So you get to come to the table just as as easily as everybody else. Yeah. You deserve that seat at the table. And you get to wear, you know, your little name bag or your whatever, your ID badge that says expert of Jenna. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and and then and then it's a matter of, okay, so you're my specialist. You don't agree with what I'm saying. We have to have that conversation though. And discuss, yeah. So it, it and that's where the team mentality and everybody's yeah. just as important as the other person, right? It is so important. Um, yeah. And that goes into patient centered care. Yes. Right? That's that's the key. That's what we're moving towards and we're getting there. And uh, there are so many articles you can look at. I particularly like Dr. Atul Gawande, you might have heard of him. He's a famous surgeon well, in, in the States. And this is what he's talking about. How Sometimes there's a big gap between what the healthcare practitioner thinks is best for the patient and yep. what the patient mm -hmm. thinks is best for themselves. Yeah. And there, sometimes this is not communicated. Mm -hmm. And we have you know, doctors, nurses trying to give uh, uh, Christina medication that she doesn't want or procedures that she doesn't want or she's mm -hmm. not comfortable with having. Mm -hmm. And because there's no communication, there's a, a, a you know, distrust can form between this patient, patient physician yeah, relationship. Yeah. And you can it erodes the faith in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And it's troubling. But we're getting better, I feel. We're getting there. Yeah, as long as as long as we as long as we're we're recognizing that it's not just a you know, I like to think of it as because um at, at BC Children's Hospital they're they're building a new basically hospital mm -hmm. and it's pissing everybody off, right? Not that the fact that there's gonna be this new building a new hospital and amazing resources, but the fact that the construction 
is messing up the fact that they already have to leave the hospital that day. Yeah. And parking is even worse than it already was. Mm -hmm. And and so it's added stress. So so you know my parents, you know, I'm I'm from Toronto and sick kids was different than I know it now. And and my parents would say, Oh yeah, that wasn't there before and, and I remember in the old hospital, you know, there's people who deal with the old building and then there's people who have to deal with the transition. And then there's gonna be people in the new building who won't have known all of the chaos that was involved in creating this this, this new facility. yeah this better facility and so it, it's not just a okay let's get this built we might have a seagull coming to join us yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so when Sorry. we're we're talking about getting better um, it's not just a okay we're we're working to fix it and then it's done the new building's there you know we're all good now. It's unfortunately, you know, depending on your mindset, you have to keep working at it. You have to keep, you know, topping up your knowledge and, right. and topping up, you know, your your how you're feeling and how you're evolving. Um, whether you're, you know, somebody who's struggling or somebody who's a helping professional, you know, you have to be willing to learn. And that's actually one of the things that I love about you guys. Like you guys are always wanting to learn in life and and not just kind of so saying, much respect for that, yeah. you know. You know, no, I, I know, I know everything, or I know everything about this topic. You know, it's, it's you know, getting excited about learning um, mm -hmm. and seeing what's out there. We, we were talking this week about all these medical advances that are being made in so many, so many different conditions, and, and it's just really exciting. You know, there's one for spina bifida, and it's for in utero surgery, so, you know, my chance is coming gone. <laughs> But and, and, and I'm excited about it and, and I'm not resentful of the fact that it's not going to help me but I'm just so excited about all these families who are going to be helped by it. I'm so excited that you know people are still working for, for what's next. Um, so that's really exciting for me. Well I think it comes down to creativity you know a lot of these individuals they want to make a better world than we're all living in. Mm -hmm. They're coming up with new creative and innovative solutions mm -hmm. and creativity breeds innovation. Yes, it right? does. And so that's where um, I think we're going to need the creative individuals out there in the healthcare industry, yeah. but also as patients or, or clients, however yeah. you want to label it, yes. um, who are saying that this is what we need. I mean, I've heard stories about uh, up and coming nanobot technology. And then the question comes, well, do I really want to be the first person to agree to have thousands of little nanobots mm. going through me? Sounds cool in theory, but then if somebody got, you know, the ability to hack them and now they're inside of me anyways, <laughs> that's a whole other round table discussion. But the point is, is that I think it's really, Really neat that there's innovators out there that say this is uh, our one life to live as far as we know yeah so let's make the best of what it is that we've got here yeah. it's not necessarily about me personally or about my situation it's about yeah. how can we impact the lives of the people in, in our future and how is that going to change our societal views on things uh, both mentally and physically and yeah. uh, um, the future looks bright it really does